Hello everybody, uh, CVM here with BBD for another episode of BBD versus CVM. And uh, we got some really sweet decks for you guys. Brian is fresh off of his Invitational Top 4. Congratulations. We would have liked to see you in the finals and become a Pack Rat token. Would have been but pretty alas, sweet. But alas, it yeah. was not meant to be. CVM and I had the Pack Rat Pact. We did. We, if either of us won, we were making a, a, a little rat action, but... Didn't it happen. It would have been really sweet since there actually isn't a pack rat token. Correct. So, world first right there. Um, I'm going to be playing the Naya Control deck that Brad and Todd designed for this tournament uh, in order to try and prey on the Black Devotion decks, um, as well as the, I feel like it's probably pretty good against the Blue Devotion decks too. Um, like those two and Esper are like the big three decks in the format. And uh, Assemble the Legion was a card that they identified as something that would be very good against all of them. Uh, and so this is a deck that they built to try and best utilize Assemble the Legion. Do you think that Assemble is good enough to try and to devote all this all this time and strategy to, or is it just something that can be beat? Devote, it's a good choice of words there. Uh, yeah, I definitely think Assemble is a very powerful card against, especially the black deck. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think Assemble beats the black deck by itself. Like, I'm not scared of Assemble the Legion out of like blue, white, red control or anything like that. But along with all these removal spells that actually handle the creatures the black deck plays, mm -hmm. there's time for Assemble to get online. And uh, probably the best threat that the, the mono black deck plays is Desecration Demon, and Assemble's very good against it. Absolutely. And again, we do have a lot of removal spells here. Chain to the Rocks handles Desecration Demon, Night Veil Spectre, and Erebos if you happen to turn them on. Um, and then we have Anger of the Gods and Mizium Mortars as basically rats. Uh, you know, in game ones, uh, you always have the potential just to lose to a pack rat on the draw, and Anger of the Gods gives us a chance to try and pull out of that. Mortars also gives us a way to kill the pack rat if they happen to play it. Um, and Celestine Charm is also a removal spell. Like you said, Desecration Demon is the best threat out of that deck, and Celestine Charm can, you know, give us a 2-2 two -two to pressure you if needed, but also handles Desecration Demon. And I think that Celestine Charm has you know, kind of fallen to the wayside with Thunder My Hellkite rotating out, mm -hmm. uh, but Demon is still still pretty good and you know Celestine Charm handles double D pretty well. It does, yeah. It, it makes him uh, certainly fall out of the sky. <laughs> <laughs> that is yeah. true. Um, now, one thing that, that I do want to talk about is Anger of the Gods. So all of the other green decks in the format are just taking advantage of the devotion mechanic with Burning Tremissary, um, Nykthos, Voyaging Satyr, ramping into like Polykranos to take advantage of your mana, Arbor Colossus. And so we are a green deck um, but we're not using all the mana ramp. We have Anger of the Gods to take advantage of the other decks using their mana ramp. And then we get to clean up with like Chain to the Rocks and Celestia Charm. So I think that that strategy is very good and a lot of people didn't see it coming this last weekend. Definitely, definitely not. And I think a lot of people probably played poorly against this deck expecting differently. Like, yeah. you know, they're bringing in their Lifebane zombies and there's no targets Just for it. literal zero. <laughs> yeah, uh, except for Smiter. And then they're like, you know, basically just like, well, it's a Naya deck, I just gotta d throw everything on the table and try to kill them before they build up, and they just get anger at the gods to win. Yeah, they just anger, and then they drop a Xenoghost or an Elspeth, and just take advantage of their, you know, the marginal plus ones that they're getting every turn from all of the Planeswalker abilities. Uh, speaking of Lifebane Zombie, while there isn't any targets in the deck, I do think that Lifebane Zombie is like the best card from the Mono Black deck at pressuring Xenoghost, which I think is a very good card against the Mono Black deck, uh, so that, you know, once we get into actually sideboarding, there might be some you know, we might actually want to bring in some numbers of life, life main zombies to try and combat Xenoghosts, but uh, it, it really will just all depend on like what cards we have to, to take out and put in. It's definitely interesting because, yeah, like, e life main zombies are really bad against Anger of the Gods and Mizium Mortars. It just gets caught up in those. But it does dodge Celestia Charm, Elspeth's Minus ability, and like you said, it does actually kill Xenoghosts. Mm -hmm. And it can attack through Assemble the Legion, too. So there's, like, Correct. value both ways. Yeah, Absolutely. Plus, I also can imagine that, like, I, I'm not going to want all the sweepers against the black deck post board anyways. Um, now, th there are some, some cards in here with a few weird numbers that I want to talk about. So we only have two Advent of the Worm. Mm. Um, that does seem a little strange, uh, but I can imagine, you know, not wanting to play a full four since we're pretty high on our top end with Stormbreath Dragon, Assemble the Legion, Xenoghost, and Elspeth. And the only actual ramp that we have is Celestia Key Room. Um, but I think that Advent of the Worm is good enough to, you know, probably warrant trying to fit a full four into the deck. Um, it, uh, what do you think? Do, they, do you think they, they just did it to try and 
keep their deck as lean as possible, or what, what it, you know, maybe it was an oversight? Yeah, you know, I don't actually know. I, from what I've heard, that that slot was originally Chandra, and they switched it to Advent. Uh, okay. Not really sure the decision-making decision process that led to that change or why there's only two. I kind of agree with you. I think a full four would be pretty awesome, uh, especially because of, like, Anger of the Gods being, like, one of the primary spells of this deck. Having mm -hmm. anything that dodges that is pretty key. Um, and, like, Advent and Locks on Smiter both are conveniently large enough to avoid it. And uh, I guess one thing about Advent that's kind of a disadvantage is that it's easy to see coming. Nothing else in the deck's an instant except for Celestia Charm. Mm -hmm. So if you're just passing on four and not playing anything, you know, either your hand's just all removal spells or all big stuff, or you're, or you're representing Advent of the Worm. So people can yeah. play around it pretty well. Yeah, I definitely could see Chandra actually over the Advents. I'm not sure why they swapped them out. That is something that uh, I, I, I do want to talk with Brad about at some point uh, during the week. Uh, but I, I could definitely see wanting two Chandras um, over the two Advents, but wanting four Advents over the two Chandras. Like, I think if I, would, if I were to go with the Advents, I would try and find a room for two more. Yeah, like if the card's good enough to play, it's probably good enough to play four. Definitely. Now, uh, what do you think about Loxodon Smiter? So Smiter is a card that is kind of, you know, fallen again to the wayside along with Celestia Charm. Uh, the, the black decks and blue decks have been pushing out the actual, you know, aggro decks. So there hasn't been much of a need for Loxodon Smiter, but Esper's coming back. There's a lot of counter spells. It's an uncounterable threat, but it's still vul vulnerable to most of the removal spells that are in the format. And I think that something like uh, Voice Resurgence just might be better, even though it still dies to your Anger of the Gods. I think I, I still feel like Voice is probably v pretty good in this deck. Uh, do you think Smiter's just better than Voice, or I think Smiter's better than Voice because of Anger of the Gods. However, I think Voice is better than Smiter in a vacuum against this format. Mm -hmm. um, I actually think that Smiter is bad against all the control decks. I I've uh, I think it's always uh, one of the fallacies that people have kind of had ever since Smiter came out is that because it's uncounterable, it's good against the control decks. Yeah. And that I just think that's completely untrue because uh, it doesn't do anything against them. Like it's just a creature. Uh, all the control decks have verdicts, doom blades, detention spheres, mm -hmm. everything. Like they're well set up. Azorius Charm is very good against Smiter. Like they're all really well set up to kill just random creatures. So that's why, like, I've never liked Smiter against control decks. Any deck I've ever played that's had Smiter, I've always sided it out in control matchups and had better results as, because of that. But I, I think Smiter is actually okay right now because of uh, the switch from like the mono black deck switching from playing. Uh, Blue Blades to Ultimate Price. So, yeah, exactly. Because of like a lot of the mono black decks are switching because of the prevalence of the mirror match, which is making which makes Smiter a lot better. But at the, in the same regard, like I don't think Smiter is that great against like the Blue deck, Blue Devotion deck either, since they have like Tide Binder Mages and stuff. Yeah, being able to actually making their Tide Binder Mage live seems pretty bad to be honest. It does, yeah. <laughs> but we do have all these Anger of the Gods and Mortars and Chain of the Rocks that can actually kill it. So eventually we get to untap. Uh, now rounding out. Uh, the lands we do have quite a few lands here because of you know all so many expensive spells, and because we're not like an actual aggressive deck, we get to take advantage of the temples that we have access to with the green red and the red white. So I know before when we were first you know testing out the Theros format, um, we you played a, a Naya deck that had a lot of issues with its mana playing all the temples and shock yep. lands with Boros Reckoner because you wanted to be casting your spells on time starting turns two through you know four or five. But this deck is a little bit different. You know, we can afford to take advantage of the card quality that we'll gain from the temples um, and not be, you know, tripped up on our mana because of that. Do you think that that's, like, if you're going to play a Naya deck, this is the way to go? An aggressive shell just really isn't possible right now? Um, yeah, like, I'm not sure on that. Like, aggressive decks have definitely been pushed out of the format a lot because of, like, the mono blue decks usually really good against a lot of the aggressive decks by virtue of, like, Tidebinder Mage tapping down creatures um, and, like, Master of Waves just being a huge beating against decks like that. Yeah, and like one of the best cards in that deck is Frostburn Weird, which is just crushes all the aggressive decks anyway. Exactly, yeah. So like, I think a lot of the aggressive decks are getting pushed out. Like, when I played the Naya deck earlier in the video, like, the reason those lands were so bad is because I was playing against Mono Red. So I didn't have time to, like, mm -hmm. sit there and play lands tap. But, like, people aren't really playing those decks that much anymore, so now you have that kind of time. And I think the selection's worth it. Yep, I definitely agree, definitely agree with that there. Uh, we also get to play some basic lands and then a Singleton Celestia Guildgate uh, to try and, you know, 
help us out with our green and white spells since we have all the, the basic mountains. And I also no. think the guild gate's in there just so you can feel angry when you draw it on turn four <laughs> and you need to cast that advent of the worm. It, it's just in there to make yourself mad. It's going to happen a lot. Either that or I'm just going to draw it on turn six and not be able to play Elspeth. Exactly. Just like the Orzhov guild gate did to me last week, Celeste Neal will do the same. Um, so uh, actually I actually am really excited to play this deck. Uh, we're not going to do a deck tech on your deck, uh, since you're just going to be playing the same mono black deck that you played recently. And uh, I actually just want to see how this matchup goes, because you and Brad were paired one of the rounds in the Invitational, but you actually didn't play because you already had a slot locked up in the top eight. Yep. And so you ended up uh, gifting Brad a slot uh, into the top eight. Yep. So his, his 8 isn't a true 8 It's true. I had, gonna, a I had a chance to beat him. Yep. So. And we're going to find out what would have happened when we battled today. But first, let's take a look at the sideboard for the Naya deck and see what options we have. All right, we're back for the sideboard for the Naya control deck. And we have some very powerful cards here, uh, some that I'm actually pretty excited about. So we'll start off with just a Singleton Pithy Needle. Uh, since our deck is focusing on swarming our opponent with a billion 1-1 one -one tokens, Jace Architect of Thought can be troublesome. So Pi the Needle gives us another answer to Jace. Uh, Miss Cutter Hydra is very good against the blue Devotion decks, as well as I think it's good against the Esper and the blue white control decks. Like they're gonna have to use a Doomblade on it, but Doomblade in general isn't very good against our deck because we have like Assembles and Elspeths and Xenagos. So they're stuck in this weird position where they want to keep in some Doomblade effects because we have like Stormbreath Dragon, and then we're also bringing in Miss Cutter Hydra. So I imagine a lot of times they'll probably you know take out most, if not all, their Doom Blades and just rely on Hero's Downfall to handle the threats that they want to. But then we just get to over overwhelm them with our Planeswalkers. So I think that just having access to the Miscutter Hydras just creates this interesting sub-game within the game on how you're going to sideboard and how your opponent sideboards. It's probably also a little bit better than Anger of the Gods against them. That is true. Yeah. Uh, we do have Last Breath, which is a card that was recently reprinted in Theros and hasn't seen a lot of play yet. But I think it's very, very good. Not only in this deck, but in like the Esper and the Blue White decks. Because it handles cards like Night Veil Spectre, w as well as Master of Waves, which is awesome. But Last Breath also kills basically every creature like in the mono blue deck uh, that, that, they, that they can play, which I just think is just really sweet. It's also very good against the mono red decks, which haven't really been around recently because of the blue deck, but they're very good. The mono red one drop decks are very good against the mono black deck, so there's a chance that they might research back up. Yeah, definitely. It also deals with, uh, it's also a clean way to ha handle uh, voice resurgence too, should that, that be needed. That is correct. I mean, it, if Anger of the Gods isn't enough, then we have Last Breath for it too. Yeah. Uh, Sun, Ho Sun Home Guild Mage is an interesting card that they played. Along the same vein of Python Needle to attack Jace Architect of Thought, Sun Home Guild Mage does the same thing in a roundabout way by allowing us to pump our team uh, while we're attacking. Um, I feel like Spear of Heliod is another card that you could play in the same slot for the same role. Uh, but after talking with uh, Todd about it this weekend, they decided on Sunhome Guild Mage because it's actually a threat by itself, whereas Spear of Heliod isn't a threat by itself. Uh, so that's why they went with Sunhome Guild Mage. Uh, I think it's an interesting card. I can imagine most of their opponents were quite surprised when they cast it. Uh, how do you feel about Sunhome Guild Mage? Yeah, I mean, I think that's interesting. Like, I, I, would, uh, I would basically think the same thing as you, that Spear of Heliod is probably just better. but. Um, yeah, it does make sense. Like, your Esper opponent can just ignore your Spear, kill everything else, and then you're stuck with, like, a do-nothing against them. I mean, you can try to kill their Aetherling after they've hit you for eight, but uh, it's probably yeah. going to blink out, so... It doesn't work that way. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, uh, Sunhome Guild Mage forces them to have a removal spell for it, or it can start to, like, overwhelm the game. Even it's by also, itself. It's also good with, like, Xenoghost and stuff. It can generate a lot of mana should you desire that. Maybe make your Miscutter Hydra, like, a bajillion bajillion or whatever. Dude, that's the goal. Negative 86, that's what we're going to try and get BBD to this time. Uh, we do have uh, two more Assemble the Legions to bring it up to four. Uh, so the, you know, the deck is just focused on taking advantage of that card. We have two Rurikthar the Unbowed. Uh, I had the pleasure of being unbowed over by Rurikthar early on in our Versus video series, and I'm definitely excited at the possibility of returning the favor. I think this card is very good and isn't seen as much play as it should right now. Yeah, definitely. Like it's it's pretty good against like the mono black deck if you can get it in play. Uh, it is a little loose against Life Bane Zombie, but yeah, it is it is quite a good card and it's good against Esper too uh, for obvious reasons. So definitely. And then we have Wear and Tear, which I think is a pretty underrated card right now. There are lots of good artifacts and enchantments and enchantment artifacts being played. So out of the mono black deck, you know you can hit an Underworld Connections and a Whip of Erebos if you need to against Blue White or Esper. 
they have detention spheres that you can hit. Uh, it's just, if Assemble the Legion starts becoming an even bigger card, it hits to Assemble in the mirror match. I definitely think Wear and Tear is a pretty underrated card, and people should be playing more of it. Yeah, I think, I think that card is just going to completely tear me up today, so. Wearing my nerves. Okay. So this is the sideboard for the Naya Control deck. Uh, we're going to be battling against the mono black deck that BBD was able to place on the top for the Invitational with. And uh, I'm definitely excited uh, to play some more games and see how big I can make a Miscutter Hydra if I bring it in. I might not, but I might. He probably won't. 